chapter 9, and we're going to read 28 through 36. <coughs> now about eight days after these things, Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up to the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed, and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, which, which, he, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. <coughs> now Peter and his companions were weighted down to sleep, but since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Just as they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it's good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he had said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my son, my chosen, listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone, and they kept silent and in those days told no one any of the things that they had seen. Here ends the reading of the Gospel. Let us pray. <clears throat> Almighty God, we come to you this morning seeking your presence, seeking the truth of what this might mean for us. How is it, Lord, that in your transfiguration we could be transfigured as well? Anoint me, Lord, for the message you've given me. Don't let it fall on deaf ears. But, Lord, let it have meaning and application, I pray. Amen. I'm still getting a little bit of feedback. Can you? I'm trying to stay in one place, but you don't know that's not going for me. <laughs> so we started our scripture reading today by Jesus saying, you know, them saying, after eight days, or eight days after these sayings. And if we don't know what these sayings are, we're going to lose the background in which this message is for us today. Jesus was with his disciples, and he's telling them what it's going to take to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And he's like, so here's the things I want to lay out for you. you got to deny yourself. This isn't about you anymore. You have got to deny yourself. You need to take up your cross. And we all have a cross to bear. And for those who will save their life, they'll lose it. But those who lose their life for the sake of the gospel will gain it. Now he is talking about the fact that for them, they're trying to, to put this into context in a physical form. And he's like, listen, if you're going to go to all, through all costs to save your life physically, you're going to lose it. But if you're willing to lose this physical life, guess what? I got an eternal life for you that won't end. And then he says... You can't be ashamed of this gospel of Jesus Christ either. Because let me tell you, if you're ashamed of the gospel, when I stand before my God, I will be ashamed of you. So he's just had all these conversations with the disciples. And now he goes into this concept of going up to the mountain to pray. The other thing that had happened just before this is in verse 22, Peter had confessed that Jesus was the Messiah. They were having this conversation and Jesus is questioning, who do people say that I am? And they're like, well, some say you're John the Baptist, others say you're Elijah, other ones say, I don't know, he's some ancient prophet. But he says, but who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you're the Messiah of God. Messiah being anointed one, the one who has been sent. So Luke's account of this transfiguration is different than that of Matthew and Mark. And what's different about it is that Luke's account is all about prayer. He's centering this account of what's going on around prayer. The other two don't mention that he was praying or went to the mountain to pray. They say that he went to the mountain. Where here, Jesus has taken Peter and James and John and specifically went to the mountain to pray. And he was praying when the transfiguration actually occurred. Luke points this out as being a very intense spiritual experience. So his focus, again, is on the prayer piece, rather than just saying that he went there, saw the glory of God, and was, was transfigured. There are many revelations that can happen during prayer. 
And Moses experienced that on Mount Sinai when he was given the Ten Commandments. He saw the glory of God when he came down. Remember, his face had shone as though he'd been in God's presence. And Elijah had an experience as well on Mount Hor. Jezebel was after him, wanted to take his life. He was told to get up and to go to this place. He goes there, and there's a great, if you remember, there was like the earthquake and the wind and all this, and he's listening for the voice of God. And how does God come to speak, Christy? In a still, small voice. A still, small voice. He doesn't come to us all the time in the midst of all the chaos. Sometimes he calls us to a quiet place of prayer. And it is there that he wants to reveal his will for us, that he wants to communicate with us, that he wants to talk to us. It is usually in my prayer time that God gives me the ahas. I can be in my basement doing my exercises in the morning and praying to God and all of a sudden he starts downloading a sermon. I'm like, I, I can't write this down and work on this elliptical at the same time. <laughs> but it's because it's this quiet, secluded place where God and I are communing with one another. And that's what happens. There's, there's got to be something to the fact that he calls them out to the mountain to pray. He doesn't say, hey, go sit in the midst of the town and have your prayer time. Like, I want to be with you. I want to be with you alone. I want you to be able to hear me. I want you to be able to see me. And that's where what set these people apart. Moses was fasting and praying for 40 days when he was given those Ten Commandments. He wasn't in the hubbub with all the Israelites. <coughs> To transfigure means that we're transformed into something more beautiful and more, more elevated. Now for Jesus, he is praying and all of a sudden, this glory of God comes upon him. And the, and the disciples are witnessing this. Peter, James, and John are looking at him and they can see that he is being transformed. His face had, was, was glowing. His clothes were dazzling white. And I'm sure for them... <coughs> that they think about the experience of Moses when he was given the Ten Commandments because scripture said that when he came down, how his face had radiated. The difference is that Moses' clothes didn't change. Moses' clothes stayed just the same. There was just this countenance change upon his face. For Jesus, everything about him had changed. And so not only were they experiencing the glory of God, but they were seeing the actual glory of God in Jesus himself. And for them, that would be transforming. Moses and Elijah appear. The, the three disciples could make the connection that Moses represented the law and Elijah represented the prophets. Two very well-known people. And so both of these, Moses and Elijah, were given visions of God on a mountain. And both of them were expected to return before the final judgment. So if you're Peter, James, and John, and you're watching this happen, and you see Moses and Elijah, there's got to be some significance why it would be those two that were chosen to be there in this cloud with God. There's something to it. We know that the Hebrew Bible is broken down into three parts, and I've shared this before. You have the Torah, which is the teaching. That's where you have the five books, um, the first five books of the Old Testament, the five books of Moses. You have the, the second section, which is the prophets, and the third section, which is the writings. And so, you know, the books of the Bible. So, in this experience, You've got the teaching, you've got Moses represented, and you've got the prophets represented. Jesus himself is coming to fulfill that scripture portion, the writings. So when you now go to the New Testament and you see phrases like this, where when the Pharisees came to Jesus and they said, Master, tell us, what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus answers, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second's like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then you see this phrase, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. On these two commandments. Why is that there? Well, think about the Ten Commandments. 
See, a lot of people think, okay, when I get to the New Testament, that makes the Old Testament not really valid anymore. Like, you really don't need the Old Testament. But the Old Testament carries with it all the rich history and all the teachings and all the laws. What's not in the New Testament that's in the Old? The sacrifices. What's really different and sets those two apart is the fact that in the Old Testament, if I sinned, I had to take my chicken or my turkey or my dove or whatever I had to do. They didn't have turkeys, but anyway. You had to take something to sacrifice. And the difference here is Christ paid the ultimate sacrifice. But are the Ten Commandments still valid? Absolutely. That doesn't mean that these rules or these laws are no longer valid. They're absolutely valid. They're just being summarized into love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Because the first two commandments speak to that exactly. And the other eight commandments talk about how we're supposed to love one another. And these prophecies have been given to us that now come fulfilled through Jesus Christ. So all of this plays a part together. In Matthew, don't think that I've come to abolish the law of the prophets. I've come not to abolish, but to fulfill for truly I tell you that until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. So Jesus is saying, everything that you've heard in these law and in these prophets will be fulfilled through me. Kind of like our Isaiah passage. All this has been fulfilled in your hearing. Moses and Elijah began speaking of Jesus' departure, which was about to happen in Jerusalem. And I apologize, but I got a really dry throat. <laughs> and the Greek term for departure is exodus. If you look up into verse 22, when we talked about, you know, eight days after these sayings, one of the things that Jesus was discussing with the disciples as well was that he was going to die and that he would, he would suffer, die, and then rise again on the third day. Now, they didn't really understand what all that was about. But now, these disciples are hearing this through Moses and Elijah. And they're confirming God's will for Jesus. That, that he will depart from them. That he will make an exodus. And so in hearing all of this, we know that just Jesus is fulfilling specific prophecies as to his death and resurrection. But in reality, he's the fulfillment of all of the scriptures. And that may be something that I don't think they were able to come conceptualize at that point in time. Perhaps later on after, after Jesus has died and the Holy Spirit's come, they begin to th see things in the rearview mirror a little more clearly, don't we all? So Peter, he's all like overwhelmed at what's going on. And he's like, well, why don't we make three dwellings? Kind of like three tents. And we'll have one for Moses, one for Elijah, and one for, for you, Jesus. And what he, was, what he was probably making the comparison to was what we know as the festival of booths or tabernacles. Three times a year, there are different celebrations to celebrate the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt. And so this was, the festival of booths and tabernacles was one of those. It was a time that was set aside to commemorate Israel's exodus. They celebrated God's provision, they celebrated that he delivered them. And what would happen is all the Jewish males were commanded to take their tithes and their offerings and go to the temple in Jerusalem and, make their, and, and give their sacrifice and their offerings. This was such a big ordeal that thousands and thousands of people would come to the area. There wasn't enough places to house all these people. So they were, they were told they had to put up temporary housing, a temporary tent, a temporary dwelling. And the disciples had a sense that what was going on here wasn't something that was going to be permanent. But hey, let's just make three dwellings. Can, can we stay here a while with this? And there were so many tithes and offerings that were offered that they had to call in all 24 divisions of priests in order to be able to make all those sacrifices, which is just an exuberant number. Um, but that's kind of the reference that Peter is making here because he doesn't quite understand what's happening. He's trying to conceptualize it. And as he's saying this, all of a sudden, out of the cloud, there comes this voice. This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. And when the voice had spoken, 
Jesus was then alone. Elijah and Moses had been taken back up in the cloud. The cloud disappears. And now they stand there, alone with Jesus. For a lot of people, you can't help but make the correlation of these words with Jesus' baptism. There are some striking parallels to Jesus' baptism. The difference is, <clears throat> at Jesus' baptism, God is speaking to Jesus regarding his identity. Okay? So, we know that in the baptism, the voice comes out of heaven. In the transfiguration, the voice is coming from a cloud. Do you remember the Ark of the Covenant that they would carry? And there was always a cloud, the presence of God above them. So that cloud was recognized as the, the very presence of God. At the baptism, that voice says, you are my son, my beloved, in whom I am well pleased. That is affirming Jesus' identity as God's son. And he's affirming it to Jesus, and we are witnesses to it. But at the transfiguration, he's saying these things for the benefit of the disciples. He's saying, this is my son. Like, if you have any question, he's my son. And he's my chosen He's the one that I choose to do what he has been called to do. And by the way, listen to him. All these sayings that had come prior to this experience were for a purpose. Listen to them. If you want to be a follower of Jesus Christ, this is what you need to do. And these disciples, of course, were awestruck. They didn't know what to do, and so they kept silent. They did not go out and share that publicly with everyone. Now, how is it that we're to apply some of this to our lives? And for me, the challenge is to seek something higher in prayer than just saying words. So often, <laughs> so often when we go into our prayer time or we pray, we're just simply praying to have dialogue with God. God, by the way, I need you to heal me, protect me, do this, do that. And we have these things. And by the way, thank you for this and thank you for that. But do we really go into prayer seeking the presence of God to seek his, his voice, his face? What it is that he's calling us to do? Are we, are we searching for, for questions and answers about what God's purpose is for us? Prayer is more than just a dialogue. And through it, we pray that we would have a, a, a powerful experience, a spiritual experience in that. We know that, yes, you know, Elijah and Moses and Jesus had these transforming things that happened during their prayer. But is it wrong for us to want the same thing? That we could be transformed through our prayer? That we would somehow know that God is, is telling us something, calling us out? And through that, that perhaps we could be transfigured to be more like Christ. But in doing so, we recognize that there is a cost, a price to do that. Because the demand on us and the cost of being obedient doesn't come cheap, does it? No. It's not easy to deny yourself, to pick up your cross, to do the things we're called to do. There's a price for that. But in that... God will reveal God's self to you in ways you've not yet imagined if you would only ask for it. Seek his face. So that we too could be transfigured, transformed more into the image of God. Let us stand together and sing. We have come at Christ's own bidding.